Welcome to episode 280 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Michael K. Feinstein, who wrote a modern day dating story that revolves around dating through various apps. So stay tuned for that interview. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd, ra- in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 280. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks, along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now let's get into the main segment. Today I am interviewing writer, director, producer Michael K. Feinstein. Here is the interview. Welcome Michael to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thank you for having me. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, my dad actually uh, owned uh, some video stores in Providence. Hmm. And so I grew up, you know, s- literally surrounded by films mm-hmm. and uh, very quickly, you know, just kind of started devouring them and watching as many as I could. And from the time that I was cued into the idea that there were people who made the films and that controlled the stories and decided when the actors spoke and what they said, I knew that I wanted to do that. Hmm. Uh, You know, at one point it was, I wanted to be a director and then another, I was like, no, I wanted to be a writer and then, okay, I could do both of them. And it was kind of shifting as I was younger, but uh, I always knew that, you know, I never even had another idea. Mm -hmm. It was never Spaceman or (laughs) Firefighter. It was always that. So, um, I went to school at NYU, and uh, I studied dramatic writing there, where I uh, concentrated in screenwriting and TV writing and playwriting. And when I graduated from NYU in 2012, um, I guess the first thing that I did was a play that I had wrote for an adaptation class at NYU, Mm -hmm. Uh, I decided it would be fun to adapt. Uh, If you remember the embattled uh, governor of Illinois, Rod Blagojevich, who tried to sell, who maybe tried to sell Obama's Senate seat, you know, I got this thing and it's golden, I'm not Mm going to give it up for effing nothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, He wrote this, you know, very quick autobiography while he was standing trial. So I adapted that into a play. And I sent it to a friend, and that it got into the hands of a, a young theater director from Chicago, and he decided to put it on in Chicago. Hmm. So there was that, and then uh, not too long after, myself and a, a writing partner of mine, Daniel Jaffe, we sold a web series to MTV, uh, which premiered on their web division, which may or may not still be in operation, mm-hmm. uh, and that was called Shortcomings. And also, while I was doing all this, I was writing and directing my own short films, uh, some of which got into some film festivals and stuff like that. Uh, So once I graduated from school, I I moved out to L.A. And, you know, I think like a lot of people, it's been how do I how do I get some traction? How do I get some momentum? How do I get that first project off the ground? Uh, And what I heard from a lot of people was, you know, don't wait for someone to give you permission to make something. Mm -hmm. And I really kind of took that to heart. And about, you know, a little less than five years ago, I set about trying to write something that I felt like I could make 
on a micro budget Mm -hmm. with, you know, the people I know and the favors that I have to call in. Sure. So I guess that would be the the long of it. Yeah, no, I think that's um, that's a great um, story. Um, Let's talk about shortcomings just for a second. You mentioned you sold this MTV series to their web division. Um, How did that come about? Was that something you wrote at NYU? And how did you actually get those contacts to make those sales? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I wish I had, you know, like a, a step by step. I know myself, I'm always looking for that kind of uh, that, oh, you do this and you do that. But I think as we learn, there's never really mm-hmm. an answer. What, you know, what it was, was my friend Daniel Jaffe, who I went to school with at, uh, at NYU. He had a short film that played at a film festival in New York. And there happened to be two executives from MTV who were, uh, you know, I guess just looking for stuff to do with this new MTV entertainment, I mean, uh, internet, I think it was called MTV U or MTV, no, MTV Other, that's what it was called. And, uh, and they reached out to him, and then Daniel and I had written together before, so he reached out to me because, you know, he wanted to see if I had any ideas. And we kind of developed something together and went and pitched it to them and they liked it. Mm-hmm. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, and I think that's, I totally agree. There's no there's no magic bullet for anybody, but I think hearing those kind of stories, the bottom line was um, he did a short film, he got it in a festival, and it's just getting stuff out there sometimes leads to opportunities, even if you're not exactly to- clear where to- it's going to totally. go. Totally, and you, you don't really know where it's going to end up. You know, when mm-hmm. I made a short uh, there happened to be someone there at a at one of the festivals that uh, that did stuff with PBS, and hmm. she wanted to put short films on PBS. So then all of a sudden, my short film is playing on PBS here in California, even though I made it out in New York just mm-hmm. because someone happened to be there. So a lot of it is luck, but putting yourself in the right situation to be the benefit of that luck. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, sure. And let's just talk about your short films. I know it's done IMDb. Um, you have a number of short films that you've written and directed. Um, just in a general sense, how did those help your career? I mean, obviously, you just mentioned you got one of them on PBS, so maybe there's some financial gain there or just some networking and context. But just in general, how did these shorts help you along your path? Well, the biggest way they help me is, you know, they, they help me develop my skills. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I would not have been able to direct a feature film if I had not directed these short films because, you know, just going through the whole process of writing something and then trying to figure out, well, how am I going to shoot that visually? And then shooting it and then seeing it in the editing room and realizing, okay, well, okay, when I did this, it, it got me what I wanted, but I didn't really get what I wanted here. So then the next time you do it, you have all the past experiences in mind. I mean, it's just... You know, it's just filmmaking is filmmaking. Mm-hmm. So whether it's a short film or a feature, you know, directing is, is a, a skill that has to be honed. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you hopefully you get better each time. So just just having that experience of being on set and talking with the DP and setting up a shot and talking to the actors and figuring out, OK, well, I can't just bark and order an actor how, how to how to get them to a place where they're going to be successful with the character or even, or even just the individual line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I say that was the, the, the biggest help. Yeah. And you mentioned at NYU, you were um, dramatic writing. Did you get, like, did you help your other friends do their short films? And the sort of what I'm getting at is how did you have the confidence and just the technical chops to be able to go and do these short films? Uh, you know, I, you know, it just, I just had, I just felt like I could do it. You know, I, I, you know, I was a little frustrated because in my program, we were just writing scripts. I wasn't in the production program, so I wasn't shooting stuff like a lot of my friends were shooting. So I kind of used some money that I had saved over the years to shoot a film over two days. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really have any reason that I knew that it should be successful. I just... I, you know, I loved film my whole life, and I, I had a short that I mm-hmm. felt like I saw tonally and visually of what I knew it could be, and I had to just take a chance. I mean, it could have, I could have flopped hard. Mm-hmm. I mean, I wasn't in film production classes. Like, it could have gone disastrously, 
but I knew, I knew I needed to try. And I had a feeling that this would be, you know, sometimes in mm-hmm. life you have a feeling about how you will be at something. Sometimes you surprise yourself, mm-hmm. but I have a feeling I'm not going to be great at surfing. Uh, so I don't surf. Mm-hmm. Maybe I would be wrong. But I had a feeling that I was going to be good at uh, directing. This was, this was a gut feeling. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, and that, that, that's really why I took the chance. Yeah, yeah. So let's dig into your latest film, the Bra- the browsing effect. Maybe to start out, you can give us a quick pitch or a logline. What is this film all about? Uh, you know, this film is really kind of about dating today and you know relationships in general. Uh, it's about two uh, couples, friends, uh, one of whom uh, has just broken up, and the other of whom uh, just gets engaged. So when the couple gets engaged, it makes their friends who have just broken up, you know, start to feel all sorts of ways, you know, oh, maybe I'm not where I am in my life. Or maybe I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So they turn, like a lot of people do, to the Internet to try to fill that hole. And they both go on a lot of different types of dates and meet people through different apps. And then their friends who've just gotten engaged they start seeing their friends having, you know, what they think to be so much fun dating. They start to think, well, maybe we got engaged too soon. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh-huh. maybe we're not uh, enjoying our 20s and 30s as much as, as we could. So even though it's about a lot of these things like apps and app dating, etc., I think it's about ultimately this very human feeling of the grass is always greener on the other side, which is something that has existed, I think, since... You know, the first caveman thought mm-hmm. the other caveman had a nicer cave. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So um, where did this story come from? What's sort of the genesis of this? Uh, well, you know, I graduated from college, I think the same, within three months of when Tinder went live. And, you know, I was newly single, and I started using it a lot. And I had, you know, a wide range of experiences on it, good mm-hmm. and bad. And I kind of recognized that this wasn't something that had been written about or I've seen in TV or movies. I've seen, oh, it, it used as kind of a punchline to talk, oh, this person's desperate or this person wants to get laid, whatever. But, you know, I was starting to see that a lot of my, the stigma was going away and a lot of my friends were using it for a whole host of different reasons to, you know, to get laid, sure, but to fall in love or to... To, to meet someone totally different than, you know, is within their bubble. So as a writer, that kind of, you know, got me excited, this idea that, okay, this angle hasn't really been done before. Someone hasn't really treated this subject seriously. Mm-hmm. So then it began became about trying to find a story where I could kind of plug in a lot of the themes and ideas that I talk about Mm -hmm. and that didn't really come until i watched by chance the uh, paul mazursky film the 1969 film bob and carol and ted and alice which is structurally very similar to what i just described about my own film Mm -hmm. it's about two couples at the end of the sexual revolution and how these couples actions affect one another jealousy grass is always greener Mm -hmm. that kind of thing so i just kind of took the sexual revolution and swapped it out with, I guess, the internet revolution or whatever yeah. you want to call it. Yeah. I'm curious, too, um, earlier when we were chatting, you mentioned that um, you wanted to not wait for someone to give you permission, and so you wanted to write something that you could potentially raise money and shoot. How much did that play into sort of the overall um, writing of this script and just deciding that this was the project you were going to get invested in? I mean, you just mentioned sort oh. of the experience stuff, but uh, maybe you yeah. can talk to sort of the practical business stuff as well. Yeah, I mean, a hundred, a hundred percent. You know, it was, you know, it, it completely dictated how I wrote. You know, that kind of consideration. You know, I knew also as much as I wanted to tell the story about online dating, I also knew that relationship movies are inherently kind of easier to make. You know, they often are people talking at restaurants and in bedrooms, etc. They're not movies that require big set pieces and special effects and whatnot. So even from just deciding on the topic, I knew it was something that was in the wheelhouse of something that could be accomplished. And then as I'm writing, you know, I'm constantly thinking, is this something that I I could accomplish with 
uh, a micro budget? Is this something that we potentially be able to do? And sometimes even with that in mind, I would, you know, down the line in the process in pre-production realize, oh, I thought I could do this, but I can't. Mm -hmm. But while I was writing, I was very much thinking, okay, well, I would love to set this in an elementary school, but would I be able to get an elementary school? Would, that might be difficult. Maybe it would be easier to get in a retirement home. Hmm. Could, could the scene function in both an elementary school and a retirement home? Are they the same thing? So mm -hmm. constantly asking yourself those questions, you know, from a, not just a thematic and writing standpoint, but from a production standpoint, you know, what can be done? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's talk about your writing process quickly. Um, just how much time do you spend outlining? Like on a project like this, how much time were you just sort of writing notes, thinking about characters, making outlines versus actually in final draft writing script pages? You know, the outlining process uh, is different with me with each project. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, I, you know, I don't spend a ton of time outlining. It's more, you know, notes, et cetera. But with this movie, because of the ensemble nature of it, I, I knew it was important to outline just because I knew if I just jumped into final draft, I, I might get lost in the kind of back and forth between the different characters. Mm -hmm. So I actually spent more time outlining this than I had any other project. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I, I probably spent a couple weeks outlining and then, you know, uh, I think four four months writing the first draft mm -hmm. in final draft sure so then once but you then, but then i was rewriting it i did 14 drafts oh, wow. by the time we were shooting okay. so i was rewriting it for two years yeah yeah and then once you're done with the script what was your steps to actually get this funded did you send it out to some producers you knew um did you try and raise the money yourself yeah i mean you know i i don't really know you know i sent it out to so I, first, it was about getting, uh, you know, people that I felt like could help me make the film on myself. You know, I, I was, I, I had at one in an earlier iteration, I had reached out to people at production companies, and there was some interest, but I could very easily see that in the small chance that something could happen, it would be something that would take a very, 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 very long time. Mm -hmm. And also, and I and I wanted to I wanted to make it while you know I wanted to make it now, mm -hmm. and uh, so very quickly I shifted to trying to make it independently. So I sent it to friends of mine that I had gone to NYU with, who were filmmakers in their own right, asking them if they if they would help me, and you know I, I signed on to producer. Uh, uh, friends of mine from NYU Film School, and my DP is a guy who, went, uh, who was my freshman year roommate. It was a very talented DP named Mark Katz, mm -hmm. and he brought on his and he he had a camera. So already I'm thinking about how can I do things for cheap? Mm -hmm. Because you know you want to hire someone with a, a camera, but also someone who's very talented. And I started thinking about people who had some disposable income that believed in me and you know uh, and you know this is where you know as you know I work really hard on my script and you know I feel like I have a certain amount of talent but I feel like it would be ignorant of me to say that privilege also wasn't a part of it you know luckily yeah. I'm someone who you know I know people who have disposable income who who can afford to uh, invest you know forty fifty sixty thousand dollars in a film of that they know they might not recoup it because mm -hmm. they believe in me. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was very lucky in that sense. And so, you know, I had a friend whose father uh, uh, had expressed that he really liked my short films in the past. And in my head, I thought, okay, here's someone who believes in me, someone who's a, who's a bit wealthier, who has disposable income, who, 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 Fifty, sixty thousand dollars doesn't mean the same thing to him that it might mm -hmm. mean to other people, and someone who believes in me and who seems to want to take a chance. Sure. So sure. it was about reaching out to those types of people, and you know, pitching it to them. Hey, you know, you might not make your money back, but we might get into film festivals, and your name's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, in the credits, and 
you'll be able to come on the set and talk with us and see us, you know, people that would be excited about being a part of a film because yeah. there, there is cachet that comes with that. Sure. And that's, I think, ultimately when you're making a film independently, what you're trying to sell people because you yeah. can't guarantee them they're making their money back. Yeah, absolutely. You're trying to sell them on, hey, it's going to be fun making a movie. Mm -hmm. How can people see the browsing effect? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like? Yeah, uh, it is going to be released Tuesday, April 9th. Uh, on uh, all digital and on-demand platforms. So Perfect. iTunes and Amazon, anywhere where you can rent and buy movies, uh, it'll be available. And then I think after a handful of months, uh, our distributor, Gravitas, uh, is going to license it to a streaming service, uh, but we don't know which one yet. But Perfect. that won't be until the summer. Sounds good. Well, Michael, I really appreciate you coming on and talking with me today. Good luck with this film and good luck with all your future films. I appreciate that. Have a nice day. You too. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis, so it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing writer-director Tony Germanario. I had him on over a year ago to talk about his film, Bad Frank. That was episode number 184, so check that out if you haven't already listened to it. I will link to that in the show notes. And basically, he's back with another film, The Price of Silence. We talk through that film and how he got it produced, so keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's the show. Thank you for listening.